Okay, everything seems to work fine. So let's begin. Can we close the doors, please? Okay, welcome uh, to the Warsaw University Astronomical Observatory Tuesday seminar series. And we are here again in the lecture room and on Zoom and on YouTube live. I'm glad it, it works again. Uh, and today's speaker is Dr. Hanna Kalkut from Torun. Uh, Hanna did her um, PhD um, in, in London in 2015, then uh, she worked in, in uh, Denmark, Sweden, and now she's an assistant professor in, uh, in Torun. She works on chemical variability across the galaxy. She's going to tell us more about this now. Hanna, please. Great, thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here today um, to talk about some of the work that my group's been working on in, in Torun. So um, I'll just begin. Uh, so my research really focuses on, on trying to understand star formation. Um, and in particular, using uh, the observed chemistry that we see in these regions to really try and understand both the, the physical conditions that are essential to the formation of stars, but also to understand the chemical conditions that can, that can occur um, and how this changes across different star, star forming regions uh, and in different stages of star formation. So um, I understand that uh, not everyone necessarily is very familiar with, um, with star formation. So I'll just begin um, with a couple of, uh, yeah, a bit of an introduction to give you some familiarity in the field. Uh, so many of you may have uh, already seen this cartoon, um, uh, essentially describing the general process of, of how do stars form. I mean, this is really the key central question that we're trying to answer. Um, of course, it's, a, it's very general, but there are still many uh, specific uh, open questions in this area of research. So here you can see we have a, a diffuse cloud, uh, and then we eventually form a dense cloud and we have some kind of collapse of material occurring um, until a central protostar is turned on. Um, and we also form uh, then an accretion disk where uh, not only is material um, brought to the formation of the star in the center, but also planetary and cometary bodies can be formed from this accretion disk. But eventually we are forming stellar systems um, with a, with a sun-like or larger uh, sized star in the middle and planetary systems. And of course the cycle continues through mass loss and so on. And of course, this is uh, an important generalized diagram of the process. Um, and we can also look at some real observations. So here's a lovely picture of the whole galaxy uh, from Hubble. And we can zoom in on uh, a particularly well-known star forming region. I think it's always good to start with a, a pretty picture. And you can see here's, here's one of the prettiest. This is the Eagle Nebula. Um, and so this is very uh, famous and well known for the pillars of creation, um, as you can see here. And these pillars of creation are known to be important areas for the birth of stars. Now, of course, in these optical wavelengths, we uh, can't really probe the deep uh, conditions. Um, they're deeply embedded within dust clouds, making understanding star formation a bit tricky. Uh, unless you, of course, go to different wavelengths. So a lot of my work is focused on using radio, millimeter and submillimeter observatories to really try and understand the physics that's going on within dense clouds. And of course, chemistry can be an incredibly important tool for this. Uh, the chemistry that we observe around forming stars uh, can really tell us the very specific physical conditions that exist. Uh, not only the temperature, but the density, as well as other things such as the presence of nearby radiation fields from companion stars um, and cosmic ray ionization rates are all incredibly important physical parameters that directly affect the chemistry. And we can of course observe this uh, here on Earth and then infer very important conditions about what we're seeing around where these stars are forming and even connect this to the actual physical mechanisms that form stars. But of course, chemistry is important beyond just understanding the mechanisms of star formation. Um, it's also very useful for understanding the entire chemical cycle within um, astrochemistry um, and comparing this to different stages of star formation, planet formation, and, and even comets. So we can um, compare to uh, chemistry studies within comets such as 67P. So this is an image of 67P. Uh, and various space missions uh, have been used to really investigate different comets and their chemical content. And we can compare this chemical content with what we, we see in star forming regions and try and understand how much of the chemistry of the solar system was directly inherited from its early parent cloud when the sun was forming. 
So this has incredibly important implications for understanding how chemistry changes through star and planet formation, and also linking to the formation of life, because we know that chemistry is absolutely essential to life formation. Um, there are some very key molecules we know from, from study on Earth that are very important for the formation of life. And we know that it's quite likely that many, uh, much of the molecular content that was critical to early processes on the Earth uh, was probably delivered through cometary impacts. The degree as to which how much of that biologically significant chemistry was delivered from comets versus developed on the early Earth um, through other events is unclear. So an important area of uh, understanding is, is detecting biologically significant molecules and prebiotic molecules, that is molecules connected to this biology, um, detecting these in comets and detecting them in star forming regions to see if really the, uh, the, the chemistry of life began really around stars, not just on a planetary surface. So this is very important in an ongoing area of study. And of course, we can link this to planetary atmospheres, which is a big um, emerging field at the moment. A lot of new missions will directly characterize the content of the planetary atmospheres of many, many different exoplanets that have been detected. And so linking all this chemistry together is a significant goal within the field. So let's move on to some big questions. What are the kind of big uh, um, open questions that exist within star formation that we still need to answer? Well, here's an image uh, that shows some of the main regions of star formation across the galaxy, uh, across from the galactic center out to some of the more outer edge star forming regions. And really what we want to know is how do the physical properties of these star forming regions affect the chemistry? What is the chemical variability in star forming regions dependent on? Um, so I'll give you a second big question. What is the chemical content of every star forming region in the galaxy? We can't possibly hope to understand how the physical properties of a, of a particular region uh, and a particular source impact the chemistry without knowing what that chemistry is. Uh, so to date, we have some idea. We have, we've done some small surveys in, in all of the regions listed here. Um, but we've never done a very large comprehensive survey that really covers a very, very large chunk of the chemistry. Uh, and we've never done a humongous survey across the entire galaxy. This would be many, many hours of work um, and a big deal. But the question is, you know, how close to that goal are we? Uh, how, much of, how much of this question have we answered so far? Well, for the remainder of this talk, um, I, I want to just focus on low mass star formation. Now, uh, we can get into intermediate and uh, high mass another time. It's certainly things I, I do work on. Um, but I think at the moment, there's been some very interesting recent results uh, that my, my group have done uh, for low mass star formation. Um, and I think so it would be interesting to, to break down some of those. So here is a, is a cartoon of low mass star formation. This is the general idealized scenario for uh, theories of how low mass stars form. And essentially it is broadly split, split into six different phases. We have the kind of very cold pre-stellar core phase around 10 Kelvin. And then we proceed through class zero onto class three and eventually a planetary system. And when it, within each of these stages, you have uh, the onset of outflows. Um, you can see it's the blue outflowing material in the diagram. You also have uh, accretion disks, which is the orange structure here. Uh, and the, the exact structure of, of accretion disks is not always known, especially in the early stages, um, but it definitely changes and modifies as the evolutionary stage increases. Um, and we have different properties of the uh, outer cold envelope as well. This is the gray um, cold material versus the kind of warmer uh, inner cloud known as the uh, hot molecular core, where we see a lot of chemistry. So I'm gonna focus mostly on class zero sources today. So these, uh, this is pictured here. So you can see we have quite an inflated uh, accretion or pseudo accretion disk uh, with quite a narrow outflow. Um, and these are incredibly physically complex sources. We have uh, the physical components of the outflow, the disk, the envelope to understand. Um, and there's a lot of physics to disentangle. Uh, but because uh, we have chemistry, we can understand a lot, not only about the exact physical properties of these sources as they are today, but also their protostellar histories because a lot of that chemistry was set in the earlier stages in the, in the pre-stellar core stages. So what we observe at the later stages is directly influenced by the history of the object. So observations of this chemistry can really tell us a, a very large picture of the um, entire process. So the very specific key questions uh, that I'm investigating are 
what can these molecules that we detect tell us about the fundamental processes that shape the chemistry in these hot molecular cores? And what can these molecules tell us about the physical processes that form stars? And ultimately, how complex can this chemistry become? Can how close to the biological pathway to life does this chemistry become? How much of the building blocks for that chemistry are born in the early stages of star formation? So here's a nice little animation um, that just really shows you the kind of simplified structure uh, of the, the star forming process. So you can see here, this is the um, cold outer envelope. And we can zoom in towards the warm inner envelope. Um, and this is where we get a distinctly different regime. So this is about 300 Kelvin. So when we're at the 10 Kelvin stage, we're very cold. So most of the chemistry that's occurring is on uh, dust grains. Um, and you kind of have icy uh, dust grains that have formed and some chemistry can occur on that surface. And grain surface reactions, as we call them, are incredibly important for the formation of very large molecules. But we also have a rich gas phase chemistry that can be um, engaged when temperatures uh, increase and go above 100 Kelvin, at which point the material that was formed on the grain surface can sublimate into the gas phase. And we can have a second generation of molecules that are created through gas phase reactions. And so in these warm inner envelopes, we see a mix of molecules that were formed on the grain surface and molecules that were formed in the gas phase. And of course, then we have the central accretion disk. So this is just an artist's impression, and you can see here the central protostar in the middle, and what is actually a very flattened disk as well as a disk wind. Um, but in fact, in reality, across a range of different sources, the exact structures uh, within some of these sources are not fully known. Um, and so you can see here the disk and the forming star. Now, of course, that was a very simplified uh, version of star formation. But more than 50% of the stars um, that we're trying to understand are not formed in isolation. Often they're formed with uh, maybe two or more companion stars. And therefore, it's a very complex structure we have to disentangle. So here is another cartoon, but uh, this cartoon is based on real observational data. So we have here um, a cartoon of the observations from IRAS 16293-2422. minus This is a low mass protostellar system. And here you see two forming stars, A and B. Now these stars are connected um, between an interconnecting uh, bridge, um, here shown in dust continuum image, uh, that connects these two stars together. But also we have outflowing material from the star. We have high density walls of gas, rotating envelopes, rotating disk structures. So you can see that from a physical point of view, this is incredibly complicated for us to probe these different physical properties. Um, and of course, it can be very difficult to disentangle this. But luckily um, for us, the, the, the chemistry um, that we observe, different molecules trace different regimes within this. Some molecules particularly favor the hot, warm gas very near where the protostars are forming, uh, directly around the, the A and the B source, uh, the hot molecular core. Uh, and other prefer the kind of colder, less dense material in between the two stars. And so these different molecules that we detect, uh, not only um, are particularly tracing certain regions in space, but they also show different velocities. So we are in fact able to disentangle this entire complicated mess, uh, presuming we, we have the, the correct level of the high quality observations. But of course, it's not just complicated from a physical point of view. Uh, the chemistry is also very, very complicated. So here, this diagram uh, just shows the chemical reactions that are possible on the grain surface only uh, for oxygen containing molecules. So you can see uh, that it's a bit of a mess. Uh, there are a lot of different molecules that depend on a lot of other mo molecules. Um, but the great news is if we observe not just one or two, but many different molecules within these systems, we can connect these pathways together. We can understand how they depend on each other. And we can use uh, the abundances of one and the abundance of another to, to infer what processes are occurring and how this chemistry is being affected by, by the physical conditions that we're observing. So it can be, it's a big mess, but we can really um, start to disentangle it if we have the right tools to do that. And so one of the key tools we use to disentangle this big mess um, is the ALMA telescope array. So I'm sure everyone here is, is very familiar with ALMA, um, but in case you're not, um, it's incredibly powerful um, and it's located in the Atacama Desert. So that means it's a very high altitude, very dry. So this is ideal for the kind of detection and sensitivity studies we might wanna do. 
We want to particularly detect weak signals, uh, especially from molecules that aren't especially abundant, which means their signal isn't very strong. So we need a very high sensitivity. And we are trying to understand star formation and planet formation. So we really need to explore these, uh, these differences in these different physical structures on solar system scales, um, you know, of kind of 80, 17 AU or smaller. Uh, and we're able to do that with ALMA. It can provide us with incredibly high angular resolution, incredibly high spectral resolution and incredibly high sensitivity. So it, today is probably the most powerful um, tool we have observationally for submillimeter chemistry observations. And uh, so I'm going to start with a very important survey that I was involved with um, that's been going for a few years now. Uh, and this survey uh, used ALMA um, to do a chemical investigation of the low mass protostellar system, IOS 2293 that I mentioned previously. So this image here is actual observational data. So you can see here we have um, the forming stars, A and B. We have the disk structures. So B is face on. Um, and A is a kind of inclined disk, um, inclined towards the observer. And you can see in blue here, this connecting uh, dust continuum image uh, between the two stars. And the Protestant Infrometric Line Survey was very revolutionary in understanding um, this object because it was the largest chemical survey ever performed in a low mass protostar. It enabled many, many detections to be achieved um, and for a real census of the chemistry to be taken. Um, and so, here is a nice little animation that just shows, oh, if we go back, shows the, um, some of the, the molecular detections that were achieved in this source. So there are some simple molecules such as glycoaldehydes that uh, is, is also known as kind of a sugar. And then it's ethanol I'm sure we're all very familiar with. And these molecules that are really tracing this kind of hot molecular core around the protostar. But we also have um, CO and isotopologs of CO that are tracing the kind of broader connecting material, connecting um, both the protostars together. So this survey was very instrumental in, in several key results. Um, and in fact, we can, if I can show you an extraction of the spectrum, um, here is one spectral line taken just from the B source in this survey. So it's about one kilometers per second wide. And so as you can see, as we zoom out across the entire spectrum that we achieved with the field survey, uh, we have a lot more lines. So this is uh, in total 10,000 lines. Um, and these 10,000 lines are, are incredibly important for us to be able to compare chemistry across the source. Um, and so this is what we did. We identified the last vast majority of all of those lines. Uh, the survey started in 2015, 2016, uh, and we're still producing some new results now. Um, but to date, we have more than 100 molecules that have been detected. This includes more than 25 molecules that are new to a low mass star forming region and uh, 19 that are new detections completely in the interstellar medium. Um, they've never been found before. Uh, and really this was achieved because ALMA is such a powerful instrument that we, we had a lot of molecules that we just weren't expecting to see. And so you can see this very, very big plot here. Now we have so many molecules, it's actually getting a bit difficult to fit them all on the graph these days. But this just essentially shows the relative abundance of these different molecules um, uh, with respect to uh, methyl cyanide, a particular molecule in the survey. And you can see that we have a, a range of abundance variation across the source. Now, of course, not everything is detected within the survey. Uh, we still have some very large signal, many uh, sigma levels of detection of molecules that we still cannot identify. We, uh, we have their transitions, but we don't know what they are. So this was created by a student of mine a few years ago, um, which found that about 20% roughly of uh, lines in the sources were unidentified. We've, we've reduced that number a little bit now. We've identified a few more since, uh, but it's one of the big challenges of a big survey is having good quality line lists uh, based that have been developed on Earth. To, to work out what lines we're looking at, we need good line lists. Um, and if you don't have those line lists, then you will have a lot of unidentified lines. And very interestingly from this, we determined that some of the unidentified lines in the A source uh, were not the same as the unidentified lines in the B source. There was a lot of overlap, but there is some different chemistry going on. Um, but we can't tell you what that chemistry is because we just don't know yet. So this project has lasted several years and has, uh, I forget now, I think more, more than 20 papers to date. 
Um, but a kind of one of the key results I really wanted to focus on today um, is the uh, cyanide chemistry. So this is some work I, I led a couple of years ago that really um, shows the importance of studying not just one or two molecules, but really searching across an entire chemical family. So cyanide molecules are molecules with um, a CN group. So for example, here, CH3CN, C2H5CN, uh, C2H3CN, and HC3N. So all of these molecules are chemically related to some degree. Um, and really, the aim of the study was to understand if the chemistry between these two sources that formed from the same parent cloud was very similar between both of them, or there were any standout differences. So here's a nice little animation that shows you the spatial emission of the different molecules that we detected. So you can see there's some isotopologues of different molecules. And broadly speaking, they trace the same kind of physical structures around both the A and the B source. Um, until we get to this last molecule, this molecule is known as vinyl cyanide. And this particularly stands out um, because we, we don't detect it towards the A source. We only detect it towards the B source. Um, and so when we actually do some direct calculations of the abundances between these different sources, what we find is that vinyl cyanide is at least nine times more abundant towards the B source. Uh, and I say at least because we, we didn't actually detect it towards A, so it could in fact be more abundant. And you can see if we even compare it. There's another graph that just does the direct relative difference between A and B. And you can see um, towards the end here, um, that you notice the vinyl cyanide um, is particularly low on the plot, um, indicating really that it stands out in difference compared to the other molecules. Everything else is broadly um, very similar, um, but vinyl cyanide is notably different. So the question is why? What is causing vinyl cyanide to really have a different abundance towards one source than the other? Well, we've performed some chemical modeling. And what we do in this chemical modeling is we simulate the entire star formation process. We simulate from the very cold beginning uh, sort of the cloud, the collapse process, the formation of different molecules, the change from uh, grain surface based reaction processes through to gas phase as the chemistry warms up. Um, and we use thousands and thousands of chemical reactions to determine the abundances at different stages uh, of this process and compute how vinyl cyanide changes uh, with respect to time and the physical conditions in this type of protostar. And the result from this chemical modeling was that we found that vinyl cyanide is only really abundant uh, in more evolved protostars. And this is really because vinyl cyanide is one of the only molecules in this range of cyanides that's heavily dependent on both gas phase reactions as well as grain surface reactions. So um, it, initially it forms very heavily on the grain surface, but then it rapidly gets turned into other molecules, um, such as ethyl cyanide, um, which is basically vinyl cyanide with a couple of extra hydrogen atoms. It's only at later stages of formation that the energy is sufficient in the cloud for the gas phase channels of vinyl cyanide to become significant. And at this later stage, gas phase uh, vinyl cyanide can proceed uh, and in that instance, it doesn't get turned into ethyl cyanide. It stays as vinyl cyanide and starts to become very abundant. Um, so this, this modeling indicates that vinyl cyanide really could be a, a really good indicator of evolutionary stage within protostars. Uh, and a chemical tracer of evolutionary stage has been a goal of these kinds of studies for a very long time, certainly since the early 90s. Um, but it's always been a, a big challenge for us to achieve. So the question is, did we achieve it with this in this particular source? Um, so I mean, here's just a, an example here would, would mean that uh, in this case, vinyl cyanide uh, observations towards the B source indicate that the B source um, is a lot more evolved. And the A source would be slightly earlier in its evolution and hasn't had enough time yet to form sufficient amounts of vinyl cyanide through gas phase production. Now there's some counter arguments to this. If we look at the outflow picture. So for a lot, very long time, people had detected outflows towards the B source of IRS 693. Um, and still to date, there's no confirmed detections of, a, of an outflow from the, from the B source. And often people have suggested that means that the B source is very young um, and hasn't had time to yet switch on an outflow, giving the complete opposite evolutionary picture to the chemistry that I presented previously in the previous slide. So the question is, 
what's right? Is it the outflow picture? Is it the chemistry? The answer is we just don't know. Um, one possibility is that um, we often portray the evolution of star formation as a very clear pathway from diff to different stages. But in truth, stars go through quiescent phases um, where maybe the outflow is barely detectable. Uh, and then something has a flare up and, and you get large bursts and you may have even accretion bursts um, onto the formation of the star, which leads to an outburst uh, in the outflow. And so what we really need to do is investigate the outflows uh, in more detail to search for evidence of previous outflows from B that we may have missed in the current data. Because vinyl cyanide could be a very promising detector of evolution, but we just don't know yet. We can't rule out other physical reasons as to why we might see the difference that we do. So then um, we wanted to move in to a slightly different project. So this uh, project um, involves the simulation of protostellar multiple formation. So obviously we've seen previously that we often find stars that are forming with many other companions nearby. So it can be very good to do large scale MHD, magnet, um, MHD simulations of star formation and um, connect giant molecular clouds to, um, to the small scales of uh, protostellar formation. So down to two AU scales. So this is what we did, um, um, me and some colleagues uh, in, um, in Copenhagen um, worked on this project to try and develop these simulations. Uh, and understand what they mean in the context of these star forming regions. So here you'll see, uh, this is just a, an extraction from the simulation. Um, this is not trying to be any particular source. This is just uh, generically um, a star forming region with, with uh, key initial conditions set up and the physics uh, of infall and collapse um, programmed in. Uh, and what we find is that the consequence uh, of the formation of multiples is a formation of a bridge-like structure. So these bridge-like structures uh, you can see um, here between the, uh, the three stars here that label the three protostars that are forming in this simulation. This bridge arc that connects them together uh, is a consequence of the gases colliding together. And these colliding flows of gases trigger the star formation process. But as a remnant uh, leave behind these large bridge and arcs, um, with absolutely, they have no velocity structure. They're kind of dead gas waiting there. Um, and eventually they are incorporated uh, and accreted into the protostars that are forming. But for a period of time of about 10,000 years, they exist. Uh, and these are very interesting structures, um, particularly because these structures indicate which star forms first. You can see from the structure within the bridge um, that it indicates that a uh, which, how the gases collided and which star it, it is indeed the, um, the first kind of star to form and then what other companions get triggered in their formation process. Uh, but of course, it's very interesting from another point of view, um, if we compare it directly to the observations. So this is the image I showed from earlier of IRAS 6293. And you can see these are very, very similar. In fact, we can even flip the uh, simulation around and we can see that the, uh, the bridge structure between the two is, is close to identical. And we didn't aim to simulate the formation of IRS 693 um, in these simulations, but this is what we found. So it leads us to another question. If, we, if the simulations tell us that these bridge structures indicate which star formed first, um, does that mean that the, uh, our observations, if they were at sufficient resolution, would be able to do the same thing? So currently the simulation is uh, 2 AU resolution and the observation is uh, 60 AU. So we don't have the data quite yet to be able to do this, but um, potentially this is a, a new tracer of evolution. So the, the only main difference you, I could say between these two pictures is that the image on the right has three stars and the image on the left has two, or does it? So we thought we would take a higher resolution image so unfortunately, in our high resolution image, we don't have the sensitivity to investigate structures within the bridge. We can investigate structures within the two protostars. So what we see for the B source is actually, it's, it's quite similar to our assumptions about the structure. It's very much a face on disk, great relief to us. All of our calculations were based on accurate assumptions. But for the A source, we see a different picture. 
the ASOS is in fact two protostars, um, uh, which are orientating each other. And you can see in this image on the right that um, it looks like the angle has changed. And this is just the difference in time between the observations, meaning that they, uh, the two protostars have moved in their orbits of each other. Um, and so um, are a slightly different angle to the angle in the left picture. But it's very exciting that we, we really do see um, the, the two protostars here. So this uh, image here is, is very, very accurate. We, we form three protostars with a bridge between them. Um, so it's a very exciting situation. Um, but of course, this is just one source. The bigger question is, what next? How do you take these ideas? How do you expand them and, and really understand their implications for, for more star forming regions? Well, this is where we come to the three pillars of protostellar evolution. And I'm very happy to say, as of was it last week now, uh, this has been funded by the um, Polish Center for Science. Um, and the aim of this project is to determine the traces of protostellar evolution in the class zero stage of star formation. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna take all these previous ideas, looking for traces of chemistry, not just vinyl cyanide, but for other particularly odd differences that we might observe, and asking the question by combining observations and modeling as to whether this chemistry really um, is, is different because of some other physical properties of the sources, for example, differences in UV radiation or um, the particular angle that you're observing the source from, or if it really is a matter of evolutionary difference. Uh, we're also going to look at um, whether these structures can be, uh, that we see in bridges, can be used as an evolutionary tracer. This has never been tried before, but it has the potential to be a very exciting new way to determine um, age differences in multi-stellar multi uh, uh, protostellar systems. And of course, we're also going to compare it to outflows. So not only whether or not we detect outflows uh, and try and determine whether a lack of outflow is a sign of an early stage or just a quiescent stage in the formation of a star. We're also going to look at very specific structures within the outflows, um, because at the moment we have a good model for variation of outflows between the class zero stage, the class one stage and later on. But we don't have a very good idea of, of how the outflow changes within the class zero stage of low mass star formation. So this project's really going to try and explore all of these ideas together, um, but it's also going to combine them into the, the first ever test three-stage test of protostellar evolution, where, for example, if you find that the chemistry indicates potentially uh, an age difference or an evolutionary difference, uh, you can use one the, the two other parameters to also see if they agree, and then ultimately potentially determine the first ever uh, marker of evolutionary difference within the class zero stage. So that's, this is very exciting, and I'm very glad it got funded recently. Um, so in the near future, we will actually be hiring some uh, postdocs and PhD students to work on this lovely project. And hopefully we should have some exciting new updates for you on that very soon. Um, but then I thought uh, that's of course a very exciting project that's really gonna look at the specifics of understanding how the physics changes within star formation. But I thought for you today, I'd also mention some of the other work I've been doing, particularly looking um, at the biological side and the astrobiology of uh, chemistry in star forming regions. So um, like I mentioned previously, the understanding of chemistry within star forming regions is significant, um, not just for, for understanding the physics, but because um, it's quite likely that a lot of molecules were delivered to the early earth through cometary uh, impacts uh, and asteroid impacts onto the uh, planetary surfaces. It's important that we understand the kinds of biology and prebiotic molecules that you might detect in, um, in a star forming region that could then be incorporated into cometary materials. Uh, so uh, one of the ways we do this um, is to go looking for particular molecules. And of course, sometimes we find them and sometimes we don't. So in this instance, this is a result from a few years ago um, where we actually detected methyl chloride, which, is a, which, which has been suggested as a biomarker on planetary surfaces. So if you detect this in a planetary atmosphere, it means there's life. Um, and we, we detected it in a star forming region indicating that it was formed not through life, um, formed abiotically. And so in this instance, it was uh, more of a, maybe this isn't the best biomarker. It's not necessarily always a sign of aliens is what the conclusion of our article said. And of course the media 
thought, brilliant, uh, aliens. So we've got these lovely, um, lovely uh, newspaper articles that came out from that result. Uh, but of course, the reality of, of trying to do these kinds of prebiotic and ash biological chemical studies um, are that we, we, tend to not, we tend to do less alien and a little bit um, earlier in understanding of chemistry than that. So one of the key things we want to do is, is really investigate this prebiotic chemistry. So this is chemistry um, before biologically important molecules are formed. So for example, um, uh, a biologically significant molecule might be RNA, um, which I'm sure many people are familiar with. It's very central to biological processes on Earth. Now, um, a prebiotic molecule might be uh, ribose. Um, this is a key precursor to the formation of RNA. Uh, and even molecules that go on to form ribose would also be considered prebiotic. Um, another important molecule is, is amino acids. Um, so again, these are very important for biological processes. Um, and of course, we have uh, other precursors such as formamide. So the range of molecules we can detect that count as prebiotic molecules um, can range from some very small, uh, maybe six atoms, large molecules, right through to much more complex uh, things. And so we have a few studies now that have been aiming to search for things. And so one of the, the, the big questions that has been a hot topic really for astrochemistry and astrobiology for a long time is the hunt for glycine. So glycine is an amino acid. Um, it's incredibly significant in terms of biology. Uh, and so for a long time, people thought, why not try and find it around a star forming region? It's been detected in comets, but it's never been detected uh, near a forming star. Um, and so detecting it now would represent incredibly significant detection in the ISM. But of course, there have been many doubters, uh, many claims of detections that have proved to be false over the years. And some have even questioned whether or not it's even stable in the ISM. So a real question is often, how would you detect it if, if glycine was present in your star forming region? So the question becomes, how do you even detect a molecular line in space? The detection of glycine is brand new, so we would have to have a very high level of evidence to claim a reliable detection. So what is the crucial things we need? Well, most crucially, we need reliable molecular line data, these, these line lists and line catalogues that we generate down on Earth based on experiments and calculations of different molecules. And we must predict the frequencies of different lines uh, and their um, spectroscopic information to be able to predict uh, what we would see in space. And of course, we must have quite small frequency errors on these molecules. Um, if you have a very large frequency error, 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 it's very hard to identify one line from another. So luckily, in the case of glycine, um, we actually have very good line catalogs because it's such a large, uh, such an important molecule of significant interest. We have very good data to go search for glycine. Uh, to date, we have two conformers, uh, this particular uh, you can see the two conformers here shown in the images of glycine. Um, we have two of these available in the line list, so we can go searching for glycine. But really, one of the biggest problems for searching for glycine, apart from the fact that um, current observations indicate that if it's there, it's, it's very weak, um, is that we have a lot of line blending. Uh, as you saw earlier from the, the pill survey that I presented, the level of line density that we see and many of these star forming regions where we might expect to go detect glycine is very high. And to be able to claim a detection, what we need is at least three unblended lines um, have to be detected at a level of uh, three sigma or higher. Um, so I know uh, many people would prefer five sigma as the limit, but we tend to use three sigma um, just to give us you know, a little bit of a, as high a chance as possible. You know, if there's a, sigma, um, a signal above three sigma, we can count that, but it has to be very unblended from any other molecules. So the question becomes, is that even possible? So I have been performing a very large study um, to try and answer that question. So here's a, an example of what glycine emission would look like. So the, uh, amount, the uh, abundances and temperatures of glycine here are based on current observational limits. So that means that the observations currently that have been taken um, People have calculated if the glycine is present, but it's in the noise and we, we don't have enough signal to detect it, this is the highest abundance it would be. And that's what that translates to. So this is uh, in the frequency range of Almaband 7. 
Uh, and what I've done is created the largest chemical model ever um, created. It's the most advanced chemical model using um, every single possible molecular detection that's ever been achieved in hot molecular cores to try and estimate whether if glycine is there and it's abundant enough to be detected, will it be detected or will line blending be the reason why you still can't identify glycine in these regions? Um, and so at the moment, as ALMA is the most powerful telescope to be able to perform such studies, I have uh, based this study mainly on how to detect glycine with ALMA. So ALMA ranges from uh, various bands from around 30 gigahertz up to um, about uh, 600, 800 gigahertz. So there's a large range of uh, frequency space. But what you actually find when you look at the glycine emission is the lines are most abundant in bands five, six, and seven. So you can, you can focus some of your uh, energy on these most abundant bands because glycine is so weak in the other bands, the chances of detecting it are very, very small. But you can see here, in um, this is uh, some examples in band seven. Uh, the orange is the glycine lines and blue is the template of other molecules that are known to be detected in these types of regions. And you can see glycine is often very, very blended. Even if you have a signal, um, it would be blended with another molecule and would be lost. So it would be very difficult to identify. However, I ran thousands and thousands of models to calculate across the entire ALMA range if it was possible. Um, and there's some good news and some bad news. So the results from all of this modeling should indicate that a handful of lines of glycine might be detected. However, the sensitivity required to detect uh, these molecules, um, as you can see here, pictured, there's a couple pictured here, um, would need more than 20 hours of telescope time. And additionally, uh, when you're going to go very sensitive with telescope time, you're quite likely to detect even more molecules that you didn't even previously know existed within these regions. So not only do you have to detect, you have to aim to detect three lines of glycine, you need to really try and detect as many as possible in case some of those lines are blended with unexpected molecules. So at the moment, can we detect glycine? No. Potentially, if someone wants to give uh, me more than 20 hours on our work, there's a small possibility, I, um, but it's going to be a challenge. But there is some hope in the future. We have some new telescopes, such as the SKA coming online, that hopefully will be able to um, get around this problem with a level of sensitivity um, and also a, a level of uh, reduced line blending in those particular frequency ranges. That means that maybe there's hope for glycine in the future, but currently it would be a very big challenge. So I just want to briefly mention um, another result that we've done recently, uh, just because it's been very doom and gloom on the uh, prebiotic molecules front so far. So it's not all bad news. Sometimes we are very successful in detecting prebiotic uh, molecules. So you can see um, this is a project recently um, uh, led by Neil uh, Turink that I'm involved with, uh, who's based in, um, in Bern. Um, in Switzerland. And uh, the aim of this study was to go searching for the prebiotic molecules glycol or nitrile and methyl isocyanate. Um, and these are significant because they're involved in the formation of peptide structures and the nuclear base uh, adenine. So quite significant in terms of relation to biology. And the aim of this was to again use ALMA to try and detect it in serpents SMM1A. This is a class zero protostar in serpents. Uh, and also again in Iris 693. And I can tell you uh, that we were successful. We were able to detect quite a lot of lines, 18 in fact. Um, so a very, very clear detection in SMM1A. Now, methyl isocyanate is detected in both sources, but for glycol uh, nitrile, uh, we only detect it in one source, which again is very interesting because it suggests a chemical differentiation we were not expecting. Um, so potentially uh, this has some implications for other studies um, because if we have chemical variation, maybe some molecules we're trying to search for might be easier to find in some sources rather than others. Uh, but it's a very interesting and exciting result that is uh, that recently came out um, that you can find uh, on ADS if you're interested to read more. And then um, one final thing that I've been uh, working on in this area is with um, a student of mine who has been um, for her master's project trying to develop 
this technique of, of stacking um, for the detection of molecules in hot molecular cores. Now, uh, I guess many people here may be familiar with using stacking as a technique. It's often used in, um, in extragalactic studies to improve signal to noise, to, uh, for example, detect uh, outflows, uh, wings in emission of, of CO from galaxies. But um, it's, it's never really been used in this way before to detect uh, molecules in hot molecular core. Um, and the question becomes, if, if your challenge is really that your signal is too weak often, what happens if you stack every single hot molecular core that's ever been detected together uh, and try and search for a signal for a particular line? Does that mean that maybe you might have a better chance? And the key here is that you do subsampling techniques. So you stack your data together uh, and you produce a combined spectrum of all of that data. And then you stack certain subsamples of that data and uh, you compare across the difference. And for sources where there is a, um, a detection, uh, you should add um, to the signal that you see. And for sources where you're just adding noise, it will not improve, it will reduce your signal to noise levels. And so that allows you to eliminate sources where there is no detection and increase your level of detections without actually individually having to get a three sigma level in each source. Uh, so at the moment, we're in the early stages of this project, uh, but the modeling indicates, you can see here, there's an image on the, in your in bottom right hand corner, um, just from the modeling, that if you sub, if you create a lot of images where some have a detection and some don't of various molecules, um, then you actually are able successfully to find a signal. So we'll, uh, we'll see uh, where this project goes, but I think it has a really big potential to do something quite significant. Um, and so really, uh, that, is, that is all I wanted to talk about today. So in conclusion, um, chemistry is incredibly powerful. It's a very important tool for us to understand um, star formation um, and understand how stars form. But of course, we still have many open questions um, as to the effects that evolution has on the chemistry uh, and also how we can use the chemistry to understand the evolution. Um, crucially, we have to approach this from from more than just one angle. You know, we can't just look at the chemistry and we can't just look at outflows or bridges. We have to use all of our tools together to try and really create a multi-dimensional view of evolution across the stages of star formation. And from a prebiotic pre molecule uh, search, there is, there is good news and bad news. You, you can find exciting new molecules still in protostars, especially with powerful telescopes like ALMA. Sometimes you put ALMA at a source that you don't even think has any chemistry and thousands of lines appear. It really is very exciting. But some of our big shiny molecules that we have wanted to find for a very long time are difficult um, and it is an ongoing challenge, um, but that kind of makes it a little bit more exciting. So uh, thank you very much. And also I should also mention that I have several collaborators involved in this work that are across the, the world. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you very much, Hannah. Questions, please. Questions. Uh, hi, Hara. Thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. And I have a quite simple question, I think, because I'm afraid I didn't really catch the um, connection of comets to the uh, star forming regions chemistry. So, could you briefly remind me what was the goal here or the hypothesis? Yes, so um, there's um, some evidence to suggest that the chemistry that we are seeing around star forming regions can be preserved through the star formation process and incorporated into comets when they form at later stages, uh, similar to when the planets are forming. And so uh, what we've been doing is comparing the uh, chemistry that we observe in, in com comets like 67P, so specifically measuring the abundances uh, in situ in 67P, and comparing those abundances with the abundances of similar star forming regions to um, similar to what we think 67p, the, the solar system would have formed in uh, and just comparing those abundances and seeing, for example, if, if the overall budgets of carbon and nitrogen are kind of similar between the two is kind of the main aim there. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions here? 
any more any questions on Zoom? No, I don't see. I I have a question. I first I, I first of all I'm surprised. Uh, I wasn't aware, you know, my ignorance is that there's so many molecules in those uh, protostars around. And with this vinyl cyanide uh, you've been detecting, I was wondering, um, do you know the masses of those protostars? Do you have any clue? Is the one uh, more evolved, uh, as you suggest, you suspect, is that one, maybe that one is more massive? And can you use the, this molecule as a tracer of the mass of protostar? I mean, we have some idea of the masses based on some modeling. Um, that has changed recently um, based on the detection of the two protostars in the A source. Um, we don't really need vinyl cyanide to determine the masses. We can do that through other um, calculations um, within the source. Um, they are similar in, in mass. There's a slight difference between A1 and A2 in the B source where vinyl cyanide is detected. Um, uh, but, but really they're, they're all in a broad range of going to form a, a solar kind of one solar mass, maybe slightly higher uh, mass stars. Um, so it's certainly not to the degree of um, variation that you would see, say, compared to a low mass and a high mass star. star. What I didn't actually mention is we, there are some similar results in high mass stars where we see a similar vinyl cyanide difference. Um, so it actually seems that the this odd vinyl cyanide standing out is not actually a function of mass at all. Um, uh, that's one of the parameters that it seems to not be dependent on, which is quite interesting. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any other questions, so let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, Hannah, and, and I'm stopping all the streams. And thank you all for coming. And